You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Do you run the incumbent president or not? That's a question everybody's asking today because of Biden's age in particular. Do you run the incumbent president or do you pick someone else? And my answer, what I believe the answer of history is, is you always, always run the incumbent president if you can. Why? No reason to beat about the bush. Incumbent presidents win two-thirds of the time. Really? Yes. Here are presidents who have run for re-election. Washington, Adams, Jefferson, Madison, Monroe, John Quincy Adams, Andrew Jackson, Martin Van Buren, Abraham Lincoln, Ulysses Grant, Grover Cleveland, Benjamin Harrison, William McKinley, Theodore Roosevelt, William Howard Taft, Wilson, Coolidge, Hoover, FDR, Truman, Eisenhower, Linda Johnson, Nixon, Ford, Carter, Reagan, H.W. Bush, Clinton, W. Bush, Obama, and Trump. Here's who have won. Washington, Jefferson, Madison, Monroe, Jackson, Lincoln, Grant, McKinley, Theodore Roosevelt, Woodrow Wilson, Coolidge, FDR, Truman, Eisenhower, Johnson, Nixon, Reagan, George W. Bush, Clinton, Obama. That's 20 out of 31 presidents running for re-election. That's 65% of the time. But you have to add in that FDR ran an additional two times, is what I should say. He ran three times for re-election. So that makes it 22 that have won in American history, 67%, two-thirds of the time incumbent wins. Anything else you do is riskier. We'll get into it in this episode. I'll tell you some great stories, as we always do, in My History Can Beat Up Your Politics, but I thought you'd like to know the answer to the question first before we do. You run the incumbent, if you can. You can't always. Why? Constitution has a limit of two terms. Sometimes people don't want to run. That was more common in the 19th century, but this and much, much more. We'll also get into that age issue. We'll get into that age issue because I'm in the unique position of having discussed this issue in 2008, and we'll talk about that. Can I think of a few exceptions? Sure, I I wouldn't, if he was eligible, have tried to run Richard Nixon in 76. You know, let's say he escaped impeachment and conviction, stayed on, and no. Outside of that, I can't think of circumstances where you don't run the incumbent president. Here's Alan Lichtman, presidential historian at American University, And he's good. I like his system. There's there's some flaws in his system. I do believe it got a little weirded out in 2016 where he sort of made a prediction. But when you look at the mechanism, it didn't actually. Yeah, look, nobody's perfect, but I think he's got some good thoughts. Incumbents have the following advantages, he lists. Name recognition, national attention, fundraising and campaign bases, control over the instruments of government successful campaign experience, a presumption of success. That's huge. And voters' inertia and risk aversion. I want to talk about the last two, which I think is really what cinches it for you wanting to run incumbent president despite whatever problems there might be in the presidency. And that's because of that presumption of success is important. It's always about The incumbent winning, does the other person have a chance of beating them? Just the structure of that news story linguistically is always where it's being talked about. When you give up the presidency, that person has to earn the right to even be in there. So if you nominate Jared Polis, let's say, or you nominate uh, Phil Murphy or Gavin Newsom, they're going to have to earn the right to be the can you beat him? But an incumbent president, even when they're down in the polls of it, is always a can you beat him. Uh, control over the instruments of government, so important. 
They can actually do things. Now they can announce things from the White House. They can command media attention. They're on the nightly news when they say something. It's, yes, as you get a weaker president, it's harder. I know that like for Carter in 1980, some of his statements weren't hitting because people had given up and, and things like that. And he had a tough election. Still think that election was made tighter by the presence of John Anderson than, than it really was. But hey, put that aside. We're not arguing here incumbent presidents always win. That's not the argument. The argument is it's always better to run the incumbent president for the better chance of winning. Still got to win the election. Can't It can only help you somewhat there. You, But I would add something else to, to Lichtman's excellent list here. You have to run the incumbent because the incumbent is always running anyway. The incumbent is always on the ballot. It's always on voters' minds. You cannot think for a second that if you run um, Dean Phillips or you run Gavin Newsom for president, that voters forget that there was inflation in the last four years, that the news media will, that the GOP campaign, whether it's looking like it's Trump, will, that Trump or whoever the GOP nominee will not spend every waking moment um, talking about it. Of course they will. They'll be linking you to Biden's record no matter what you do. That that link will happen. You accepted a party nomination. Before I start here, where I really get into this, first of all, I want to thank uh, Edward Carlson. I don't know. If you're from Iowa, maybe you're a relative, probably not. It's a common name. Thank you. Joel Rosner, thank you. Ben Lickstein, thank you for your recent donations to My History Can Beat Up Your Politics. Appreciate it. I have a group of people who have been donating for quite a long time and keeping this program going. Dimitri Friedman, Robert Hemsath, Jacqueline Van Patten, Gretchen Waldo, Winston Stauffer, Joe Dweck. Christopher Weininger, Ben Wood, Joseph Kaufman, Mark Salter, Travis Fouts. It helps the program. As I said before, right now, this is the only thing I'm doing. All right. I, I don't, uh, you know, this is my full-time job right now. It's not going to be forever. And I don't think we're, we're a top 5% podcast, but unless you're in that top one or uh, you do a kind of podcast that's kind of a mixture of your own business, like a consultant doing a podcast where, yeah, the one's helping the other. And unless you're doing that, I, I tend to think these things are always a little bit of a side hobby. But I have to tell you, the podcast has, because of your support, has been great. Um, and to a limited extent, the advertising from uh, that I do on this program, though that is not stable and it has gone down in 2023 with the weirdest in the economy like anything else. So your donations and, and gracious support have really helped uh, to not freak out when something like a job loss happens. And I know at least I have some kind of income from this and uh, that this isn't just some crazy idea to be talking into a microphone and have people listening, which in the end of the day, that's all it is. All right, back to our topic here. Why run an incumbent president? Why not make a change? From the diary of Rutherford B. Hayes, June 11th, 1880. General Garfield's nomination at Chicago was the best that was possible. It's altogether good. The defeat of the unit rule was an important achievement. Likewise, the defeat of rule or ruin senators who usurped the power of the people. And the defeat of third term. This was an attempt to get Ulysses S. Grant a third term against so great a chieftain as Grant. There is much personal gratification in it. Rutherford B. Hayes writes, The defeat of those who had been bitter against me, the success of one who uniformly has been friendly, and Ohio also to the front again. The endorsement of me and my administration. Rutherford B. Hayes, a president we don't talk a lot about 
a lot. Um, we don't know the politics of that era a lot, something I'm always trying to change on this program, and Will Moore. The way to think about him, as he referenced there, is he's a president after Grant. He is a Republican. So was Grant. Grant decided because of scandal, really, in his administration and the economic situation in the country, he would not run in his own name for president again, but would allow the Republicans to select someone else. They selected the reform governor of Ohio, Rutherford B. Hayes, a Republican, but in many ways in politics, on civil service reform and other things, different from Grant. After serving four years and living up to his promises about hard money and civil service and tariffs and the like, battling with the Democrats in Congress, Rutherford B. Hayes had decided on a one term. And so he didn't run. He elected not to. And he successfully saw that Republicans nominated someone else in his stead that was close to him. He liked this. He does have one comment that's going to turn out to be wrong, but who could predict it? The sop thrown to Cockling in the nomination of Arthur for vice president only serves to emphasize the completeness of his defeat. But in this June 1880 letter, there's something that Rutherford B. Hayes is still focused on, and that is how is Garfield, this uh, congressman, running, uh, actually the first, in, in my knowledge only, sitting congressman to run and win for president, uh, how is he going to, how is he going to win the election? But now, how to win? The contest will be close and fierce. We may be beaten. Oregon begins the campaign with a good first gun. We must neglect no element of success. There is a good deal of strength in Garfield's life and struggles as a self-made man. Let it be thoroughly presented in facts and incidents, in poetry and tales, in pictures or banners, in representations, in processions, in watchwords and nicknames. How from poverty and obscurity, by labor in all vocations, he became a great scholar, a statesman, a major general, a senator, a presidential candidate. Given the amplest of details, a schoolteacher, a laborer on the canal, the name of his boat, the truth is no man ever started so low that accomplished so much in our history. Not Franklin or Lincoln, even. Oh, Hayes said the L word. Hayes is given marketing advice for this campaign. He wants this candidate that represents his administration better to win. And in the end, he'll get his wish. Garfield does win that election. It's a tough election against a Democrat, uh, Winfield Scott Hancock. Real tough election. There ends up Garfield gets tripped up in a, a scandal about a letter that turned out to be fake. That He didn't know whether he wrote or not all this stuff. But put that aside, uh, Garfield wins. And you have a successful presidential pass off where a president is sitting in his office and he's able to hand off to a candidate of his own party. The trouble with this example is it's in the 19th century when it was more common for presidents to run for, say, just one term, get away with it, and it was more accepted. Now it's not, and it's seen as something when it's done. I mean, it's, it's simply less common. And the recent history is that there aren't too many successes. The most recent time that a president decided not to run and and they weren't constitutionally limited, is 1968 with Lyndon Johnson. They run Hubert Humphrey, and his party loses the White House and hands it over to the Republicans and Richard Nixon. That's the last example we have is 1968. What about before that? Not quite 100 years ago, 1928. 1928. Okay. And... Cal Coolidge hands off the White House to Herbert Hoover. Coolidge and Hoover are not fast friends. Coolidge does not like Hoover. He doesn't like regulation. Hoover does. Hoover likes to support business and promote business in the same way that Coolidge does, but Coolidge prefers a much more hands-off. As one commenter said, you know, his the people that he appointed – to regulatory positions, created an air of invisibility. And Hoover was much more of a regulator. He would end up regulating aviation and radio during his time as Commerce Secretary 
under Coolidge. Thought he'd be more interventionist, and he didn't like him. But publicly, you see the pictures, Coolidge, Hoover, sitting on the lawn chairs, on the White House lawn. Snap, snap, photos taken. Newspapers across the country. That's what people are going to see. And that's all that needed to be done. You never saw evidence of public antipathy between Coolidge and Hoover. So the rest doesn't matter. Public doesn't know the behind the scenes. He's complaining to Grace Coolidge that not his favorite person, etc. Okay, so you do have a successful pass off there. That's 100 years ago, guys. Before that, you have to go to 1908. So you have to go 20 years before that, 1908. Teddy Roosevelt passes it off to Taft. I talked about that a bit in a podcast that I did way back. In 2008, here it is. A cartoon in a newspaper prior to the 1908 election showed President Theodore Roosevelt next to what appeared to be a mirror image of himself, except when one looked a little closer. In the mirror image, the Rough Rider pants that the TR lookalike was wearing were stretched to the bursting point. And he didn't really have Roosevelt's face, but rather it was a sort of Halloween mask of the grinning face of T.R., fastened to his head by a string. Indeed, the mirror image in the cartoon was William Howard Taft. The not-so-subtle joke in 1908 was that Theodore Roosevelt, who had taken a pledge not to run for a third term, was finding a clever way to keep himself in power. He anointed his friend, his Secretary of War, and Governor of the Philippines, William Howard Taft, as the nominee of the Republican Party. Taft had a lot going for him. As Governor of the Philippines, one has to understand, in the early 1900s, the Philippines presented a huge problem for both William McKinley and then for Theodore Roosevelt as he took over the government after McKinley's death. The Philippines were torn by rebellion, Soldiers there were dying. It was the Iraq of the 1900s. And Taft was an able governor and did much to handle the situation there. While Taft's presidency would lead to problems between he and his mentor, he had no problem winning the 1908 election. He easily beat William Jennings Bryan, running for his third losing campaign. And the issue in the 1908 race was simply Teddy Roosevelt's support. No one doubted Teddy Roosevelt supported Taft. He made numerous speeches supporting his candidate. If you wanted to continue the progress of Roosevelt, you voted for Taft. Um, I mean, and that's it. That's, so the last president voluntary step down, as we said, is Lyndon Johnson. Last one step down where he was eligible and to win is 1928, Al Coolidge and Herbert Hoover. Before that, T.R. and Taft. Before that, Rutherford B. Hayes and Garfield. Record books getting kind of old on that. And here's the thing. So we have the 22nd Amendment. President can't run for more than two terms. So they're forced to give up the presidency. They may not, they may have wanted to run. You know, Reagan wrote an op-ed saying that it was unfair that there could be senators serving since the 1960s. And here he was only serving for eight years in the 1980s and he wasn't able to run. So, so you know, yeah, you have that argument out there. Doesn't matter. The Constitution limits that. So presidents since Eisenhower have been limited. And here's the stat from that. Presidential pass-offs with the 22nd Amendment is in effect are not doing much better than voluntary presidential pass-offs. So we have Eisenhower, Johnson, Reagan, Clinton, George W. Bush, and Obama. All did two terms and had to pass off. That's six. And only one of the six, Reagan, was able to get a candidate of his party elected and hold on to the White House after his two terms. Horrible record. One out of six. Bad chances. So whether you leave the presidency because the constitutional rule or because you choose to, the vicissitudes of electoral politics don't seem to care. They're just not good. You've given up the wheel. That's the way I look at it. Now, another thing is the quality of the presidential pass-off, which was something I examined more in in a past episode. 52 years later, as President Eisenhower wrapped up a press conference held in 1960, the same year his vice president was running for the office that he held, a reporter asked Eisenhower to name a time where Vice President Nixon had helped him with an important decision. 
Give me a week, Eisenhower answered, and I'll think of one. The quote was all over the news, and it was seized by the Kennedy campaign for a radio ad that was played over and over again in important markets. It undermined Nixon's strength in that election, his connection to Eisenhower. Here was the incumbent president who could not name a decision where Nixon had helped. And it is true that too much was made of this quote. To be fair, Eisenhower did not really mean to say what was reported. It wasn't how he meant it. He really meant that at the next weekly press conference, he would prepare an answer for the reporter. It was a simple banter with a reporter, and it was not meant to be you know, a public quote. Eisenhower made several statements after that press conference affirming his support for Nixon and citing areas where he had been helpful. So that perceived relationship, and there's also some commentary that, oh, you didn't use Eisenhower enough in the campaign, and Nixon claims that maybe Eisenhower said that she was concerned about his health going out there campaigning. So it's really a lot of tension all the time once you're not running the incumbent president. And I think there's tension, there's subtle tension in some of these recent, certainly, between Hillary Clinton and Obama. I mean, not all, you'd have to get into the the nitty gritty of reporting and stuff to see it, but, you know, it wasn't like he went out of his way to endorse her in primaries or anything. Clinton and Gore, very good relationship in the beginning of that administration, a little tense as Gore starts to run for the presidency, also tense on the Gore side of things, where he wants to keep Clinton at arm's length because of the Monica Lewinsky situation and certain states like Tennessee that he'd like to win, right? Slip between cup and lip. Put those kind of subtle moments aside. Now, have you had a situation where a person just ran and completely ran away from the president said, I, I'm a new person. I don't even acknowledge the policies of this person. He did. And it's 1896, and that is when William Jennings Bryan gets the nomination, really takes it away from Grover Cleveland, who's the incumbent Democratic president. William Jennings Bryan, in this surprise win after this amazing speech, gets the silver rights, campaigns on silver money, Cleveland's for hard money. He's exactly opposed on this issue. Nonetheless, Even in that campaign where Brian's saying, I have nothing to do with that Grover Cleveland, if you think for a moment the Republican campaign opposing Brian was going to allow uh, him to get away with that, you're kidding. So the opposing campaign routinely, yes, they painted Brian as this crazy silverite, uh, you know, demagogue the same way that his own party's president, Grover Cleveland, would. But they also linked them to Cleveland's policies that weren't popular, like the economy and the tariff, which they linked together because Republicans wanted high tariff, Democrat low at this time. And on that issue, Brian had the same position as Cleveland. That's going to happen with any run you do. That is the last time that I can point to, um, you know, okay, so I guess you can say McCain, George W. Bush, but I don't really think so. Um, I, I do think there were two different people. And, you know, let's say on campaign finance reform, they had very different ideas. They had run nasty campaign against McCain, the uh, Bush people had. But on policy, he was going to continue the Iraq war and, and probably double down. So that's kind of an extension of Bush's policy there. I don't think you had a complete runaway from Bush. Nonetheless, uh, Bush's approval rating at that point is so low that he's not he's not helping. It's unusual not to run the incumbent president when you have a choice and doesn't appear very successful. And it's very rare to not just run away from the president, but to say, I have a completely different agenda than that guy. I'm going to do things differently from that guy. The successful campaigns, the couple that you got, they were saying, I'm going to continue the prosperity of Coolidge. I'm going to continue the prosperity of Reagan with maybe a little hint of something different, a little different style. So if you look at the the two recent successful pass-offs, really the three, because I'll include um, TR and Taft in there, you've got to attach yourself to that president. 
So even in your own campaign, you're going to try to. So let's say you pick a, a Buddha jug, or let's say you pick a Jer- Jared Polis and you, and G- Gavin Newsom, and you run for the Democratic nomination and get it. If you're following the three last successful presidential pass offs, you're going to have to run on the Biden record in any case to follow that example. Anything further to say? Yes. That's just talking about the campaign that you have to run. Now, when you get to what are voters going to think, it's my sincere belief that voters are going to assign that president's record to you. And I think that's seen in the historic examples. You are responsible, no matter what your name is, as a Democrat running for the Biden record. Elections where you've had an incumbent president, even when they're not on the ballot, are about that president's record and that, and that's what's going to be up for discussion. I'll add one additional factor. You have a president. This is a real issue. If you don't run an incumbent president, uh, the presence of a president in the White House is going to complicate that situation endlessly. Do you know how many times reporters are going to be asking that president questions and looking for any hint of disagreement between the incumbent president and the candidate. It's also going to take away attention from the candidate because the president's going to be active and doing things. That's one of the reasons you want to keep an incumbent in office. The president's going to be active and doing things. They're a newsmaker. The candidate has to then become a newsmaker, going to be competing for news attention, especially after, say, that two-week period after the convention. Or the moment they win the primaries and are and are pretty much the winner. You're going to be competing with the incumbent president for news. You don't want that. You want those two people to be the same. Oh, I mean, of course you have the possibility maybe the president isn't excited about being passed over. And I could certainly see you know, Biden's a pretty competitive person. I could see some of that happening. There could be some resentment. Oh, now you got... Now, even if you're able to convince the incumbent president to stand down and please support the campaign, boy, you've got issues there. I go to 1968 for examples of that. I mean, that was just a rich example of president who, yes, he said he stepped down. I've done some looking at that issue and found that maybe he might have accepted a draft at the convention, despite his support for Humphrey and all of this. Humphrey said that he was given nothing in terms of his convention battle and his general election campaign. It it appeared to him like Johnson wanted him to lose. But there's resentment there. There's a thinking, hey, maybe for my legacy, maybe I'd rather have uh, an incumbent part, an opposite party president come in here. Maybe they're going to actually run things closer to me. (laughs) And, And don't think the opposition party won't help with that. I mean, Nixon was... The whole Nixon campaign in 1968 made sure that they had operatives watching Lyndon Johnson, what he said, and to try to remain to make it look like they were close to Johnson's policy, at least in terms of um, giving the administration support on foreign policy for the. Okay, so now there is a unique situation going on here, and I get it. President Biden is the oldest person to serve in office. I cannot bring up how ironic it is because he was somebody who began his career as one of the youngest senators ever to serve. And he was like the young guy. But put that all aside. We're talking 2023. And history doesn't always have to tell you what to do, despite the name of my show. I know that. There can be new events. Somebody very well could take the mantle from Biden run a campaign, run it better, win the presidency. The only thing history is sitting there in books to do is to tell you, look, here's what happened when we tried this before. Just like in any profession of business or sports or finance or construction, you use the statistics on record and you use the previous history on record to determine what may happen in the future. History would have said that someone as old as Biden couldn't get elected to the presidency. I did a podcast in 2008. I was really proud to get in the New York Times magazine at that time about age and the presidency. And it was kind of cool. And the reason I got in the New York Times magazine is because I made it very clear that John McCain's age was not a negative factor 
in running against uh, Barack Obama, which was being presented as a big one at the time. Age of opponents, differences in age, couldn't necessarily tell you who was going to win an election. Other factors could. The fact that he was a much bigger factor is he was trying to run with the Republican nomination in 2008 when George W. Bush had a 34% approval rating. He was the previous incumbent. President endorsed him, albeit in a weak kind of video speech without a public appearance but at the convention. But nonetheless, you know, he's running as the Republican nominee and against the Democrat. But not age. And I went over a bunch of different examples. Uh, Reagan previously was, this was heavily discussed in 1980, whether Reagan was too old. When President Reagan tapped former Senator Howard Baker to be his chief of staff, there was something that Baker wanted to be sure of. He had been outside the White House, so he didn't know if the rumors he had heard were true. Was Reagan really in control or just a puppet of staff? particularly Don Regan, who Baker was replacing now. Baker brought several of his trusted aides into the White House operation, and today he asked them to come to the Oval Office and for each to sit in different places so they could get different angles on the commander-in-chief. The door opened, and in walked President Reagan. He smiled and engaged them in conversation and discussion of policy issues. The aides all concurred. Reagan was upbeat, upright, and completely in control. At age 76, he was the oldest White House occupant ever, born six years before John F. Kennedy, two years before Richard Nixon. He had first ran when he was 57, right in that average age group, but it took some time. He had a president, Nixon, with two terms, one that Ford filled out, and then he was denied his party's nomination in a primary. So it took, took some time to 1980 for Reagan to make it to the presidential stage. Reagan's age had always been an issue in his 1980 election against Jimmy Carter and especially in his re-election. Journalists noted during his presidency that he didn't always answer questions, sometimes looked out into space for a few seconds, and at photo ops, a staff aide or Nancy Reagan sometimes had to whisper an answer in his ear. Reacted a little slowly. Then there were some of those incidents at the time when he said into the microphone as a joke that we were bombing the Russians now, not a very funny one, or a more private moment when flying over Los Angeles, he couldn't remember the names of canyons that he had been always known. Some friends were concerned. The height of speculation about the age issue came during his reelection at the first debate with former Vice President Walter Mondale. Reagan looked simply bewildered. He had trouble putting his sentences together and forgot his clothing statement. The age question spilled into the news media, and in the next debate, Reagan was asked by uh, one of the debate moderators, President Kennedy had to go for four days on and with very little sleep during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Is there any doubt in your mind that you, Mr. President, would be able to function in such circumstances? Reagan responded, Not at all, Mr. Truitt, and I want you to know that I will not make age an issue of this campaign. I am not going to exploit for political purposes my opponent's youth and inexperience. Everyone laughed, even Mondale. The line killed the question of age for the campaign, and Reagan won with 59% of the vote. It's worth noting as we talk about age in the presidency and that Louisville debate that sometimes history beats up politics. That's what we're always trying to do. But a few times it's the reverse. Current events can provide perspective back to history. We saw that even a 51-year-old president can have a bad first debate if they don't prepare enough and look a little out of sorts, maybe even sick. Of course, no one blamed it on Obama's advanced age, did they? Questions lingered about Reagan's presidency. Even in 2011, with what would have been his 100-year birthday, his son, Ronald Reagan Jr., hinted that the Alzheimer's he had announced that he had in 1994 may have taken hold while he was still in office. After all, Alzheimer's is known to have as, as much as a 10-year onset. His other son, Michael, disagreed, and no medical professional observed his condition until an accident that he had on a horse in 1989. This was after he was out of the White House, and even that diagnosis was unclear. Biographer Edward Morris, who was, along with Reagan, 
during his presidency, scoffed at the idea that Reagan was not in command ever. Reagan had a few senior moments, memory lapses, but nothing major and nothing near Alzheimer's. The real question is whether Reagan's age changed how he acted as president. Because he put in a few less hours, took some naps, deferred to staff more, did that mean that others controlled his presidency? And those same questions could be asked of Eisenhower, too. The Iran-Contra scandal may not have occurred with one of those multitasking, micromanaging-type presidents, you know, Kennedy, Johnson, Clinton, maybe Obama. We'll find out when the White House memoirs come out. You can imagine, say, you know, him saying, hey, hey, what's this North guy doing? Or what's this Poindexter not telling me? Why am I meeting with these private fundraisers all the time, raising support for the Contras? You know, the Tower Commission, which reviewed the Iran-Contra scandal, said that the president's management style is to put the principal responsibility at the shoulders of his advisors. He did not force the policy to undergo critical review. Reagan's deference to staff worked better when he had James Baker, Michael Deaver, other advisors with him. It was worse when Chief of Staff Don Reagan took over. Reagan was a good friend, buddy-buddy with the president, but didn't serve him well, and eventually, after Iran-Contra, was out the door. And I can't really answer the age question totally here, except to say I've talked about it before, talked about it with a Republican candidate, and said it wasn't the factor that we all concerned about it. I also would point to a couple of things. The leading Republican candidate is older as well. You're talking about a three, four year age difference. Are you really banking everything on three or four years? The basic plan here, if we follow the polls, is we're going to be running two older candidates. Uh, and then age was brought up against Reagan in 80. It was brought up again in 84. And the age issue was not a successful one. It was temporarily a boost to the Mondale campaign in 84, but it was not a successful one. But in essence, I know we're talking about such an advanced age that it's I can't um, ignore it, and I don't want to. I also want to point out that on this very podcast, if you had listened uh, when we did You Break Everybody's Back, the 1988 campaign, I mean, Biden had a stroke as early as the 1987 primaries that he was running in. When they were over, he goes up to New Hampshire and has a stroke. I mean, so there's certainly health concerns about the president. And where do I put that? So, so, so Bruce, why aren't you considering that? You know, again, I say you run the incumbent president if you can, and it may be you can't. That's going to be to a degree up to him. He's already indicated he's running. Straight up, just me guessing. Modern medicine guy doing the job that he loves and loved all his life, running against a person who's also older, probably subject to some of the same percentages here of, of chances. I think you're talking about someone who'll make it through the 2024 election, but voters have every right to be in this election particularly critical of the vice presidential choices and the bottom of the ticket. But I also believe in this reality. We we constantly say that we're not party people. We're we're all independents now. We hate parties. And that, yet that's not really true. Americans usually lean to one set of policies or another. And that's really what you want. And the one for all the negatives of parties, one positive thing is you generally get a set of political issues and and it's more polarized now, so this is even cleaner, political issues that you know you're going to get. No matter who's the nominee, you run a candidate, your set of policies that that president's going to pursue is the same, whether it's Biden or whether it's Harris, or in the very unlikely situation that someone else was nominated for vice president, you're going to get the same policies. So the person in our voting becomes less important, the more polarized we are. And the other thing I'd point out is that given all these polls that say, I, I'd rather have someone else than Biden, Biden's too... It, Look what happens when they insert someone else in there. Okay, who would you like to have? No one's charting in any kind of decent numbers. So all of this tells me we're probably going to keep the, the uh, candidates we have. So the first competitive election in this 
United States is 1796. I like Stanley Elkins, The Age of Federalism, and one of the things that he talks about that immediately as Washington decides he's not going to retire, it sets off a race, but it's a quick one. It's a quick one. They only have a couple months to run an election. And one of the things that the Republicans, and at that time, Republicans were Democrats, you know, it's Jeffersonian Republican type thing, um, were noticing about the Federalists is that they had this advantage of having this mantle of Washington. Here's what Elkin says. The presidency of George Washington was more like a reign than anything we have seen since. This is not simply a figure of speech. It should be taken as a functional item in the as yet unoriented state of politics in 1796. Prior to the American and French revolutions, the people of Europe and America alike had been accustomed to picturing ultimate authority from whatever source the legitimacy of it might be supposed to derive, as embodied in a crowned sovereign. So deep, apparently, was this need that the French themselves would shortly clutch at it once again and retain a royal or imperial person at the head for another 65 years. It's after the French Revolution. Yeah, they had the citizen king. and Not so the Americans. One of the things that permitted so easy a transition to republic and emboldened the Americans to have done with kings forever was the confident realization that with Washington, they needed no king. Stanley Elkin says in there, we haven't had anything since like it. And I know that that's true. It is my belief that some element of Washington always remains in the presidency. He set the example. Everyone who served before is embodied in that office in some little way. And there's a little bit of that patriot king, no matter who's serving, a little bit of it, the trappings of office, the majesty of the Oval, Air Force One. There's a little bit of that office in anybody who runs. Why on earth would you give it up? And that's what I think about that. Hey, everybody, thanks for listening. Website is www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com. If you like the program, please mention it to somebody. You know, help us out. Thanks for listening. Appendix. Um, in my previous episode on Age and the Presidency, I had this little section on this guy who's an older Revolutionary War soldier, just to kind of see that it it's not longevity statistics average get thrown off by the fact that there's infant mortality increases as you go back in history. So there were older people that existed. So here's the story of an old Revolutionary War soldier. Didn't quite fit into the episode. Put it in the appendix. Come with me to a little stone house by the edge of an old country road, once the home of a living, breathing history book. In 1867, Samuel Downing of the small village of Edinburgh, New York, died. He was 106. Downing was, at the time of his death, the last Revolutionary War soldier receiving a pension from the United States. He told a contemporary magazine writer who came to visit him shortly before his death how the Americans whipped Burgoyne at Saratoga, not far from where Downing lived. Gates, he says, was an old granny, and Burgoyne was surprised to have to give his sword to him. Arnold, he said, was a fighting general who should have been treated better. Washington was a nice man, but you never got a smile out of him. A delightfully spry interviewee, Downing was asked what he thought of the present rebellion. This was, after all, the time of the Civil War. 
Downing said to the writer, If the rebels came here across that hill, I shall sardingly take my gun. I can see best furthest off. I only wish to live to see the rebels crushed. Indeed he did, as did Revolutionary War veteran Lowell Cook of Clarendon, New York, who passed in 1866. Cook actually had a signed letter from Washington about his service. He was also 106 at the time of death. The human history of the Revolutionary War should have ended with Downey. But then, in 1867, two years after the Civil War, Congress awarded a special pension of $500 to Daniel F. Bailman, also of New York, who hadn't been able to previously prove his service to the satisfaction of New York State. He would die in 1869, his age 109. And just as the last Revolutionary War soldiers would live past the Civil War, the last War of 1812 veteran would live past the Spanish-American War, the last Mexican War veteran would live past World War I, and the last Civil War veterans would live past World War II. The path to Samuel Downing's country house in a discussion of soldiers' ages may be a long but hopefully interesting way to say this. Age isn't what it appears to be in a statistical chart when perceived by history. There were indeed people born at the birth of America who lived to see their hundreds. While average lifespan has increased, it was 38 years at the nation's birth, 48 years in 1900, and is about 78 years today. That doesn't mean that people didn't break those rules, that there weren't delightful people still around to enrich history books with real stories of what happened. That a few were able to dodge the invisible infections and cancers unknown to the world at the time and beat the odds. There were also more births and higher childhood mortality rates, which always have skewed the statistics of life expectancy. (laughs) 